students, and welcome back to another lecture for CORE 202. Today, we're going to talk about Charlotte Perkins Gilman, and specifically her piece, Women and Economics. So even though the part we read was short, we still have a lot to cover, so let's get started. So let's begin, as always, by introducing the author. Here she is. This is Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who had a couple of different last names over the course of her life, which we'll address. Uh, she lived from 1860 to 1935. So she was living through a time of immense change in America, especially in regard to the role of women. And that was the primary thing that she wrote about. Um, she was a writer, but she was also an artist and an activist. She was a really famous lecturer, um, and she spent most of her life traveling around and talking to big crowds. So her education was rather incomplete, kind of spotty. Um, she was born to impoverished parents, and basically her schooling was here and there. Um, she mostly lived with her aunts, and one of her aunts actually was Harriet Beecher Stowe, who you may remember as the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And I'm not trying to say good things about Uncle Tom's Cabin, but I am saying that she did belong to kind of a literary tradition. Uh, there was an understanding that women in her family were good writers and that they could make their life out of writing, which was kind of unusual at the time. So primarily her education was in the hands of her aunts, although she did go to the Rhode Island School of Design for a little while um, as part of her college experience. After that, she got into a whole series of relationships. And in a lot of ways, these relationships did dictate what she wrote about and what she thought about and what she was able to do with her life. So one thing worth mentioning is that even though she never directly addressed it, she was in relationships with both men and women. Um, she married two different men over the course of her life, but she also had long, sustained, meaningful relationships with women in her life. So basically, while she was at the Rhode Island School of Design, she was in a very intense relationship with a woman named Martha Luther. But then she married this guy, Charles Walter Stetson, uh, with whom she had her only child, Catherine, who we'll talk about in a second. Then she was in another relationship with a woman, but then she sort of later in life uh, decided that she wanted to be married to a man again, um, and she married. Houghton Gilman, who was her first cousin, but we'll talk about that later. So the reason that her daughter is relatively significant um, is that after the birth of her daughter, Gilman suffered postpartum depression. And that's what we call it now. But at the time, there wasn't really a word for it. Or if they talked about it, they just told the women that they were being hysterical. So as part of her recovery, kind of, um, she was subject to some kind of unusual treatment. So there was a very famous doctor at the time, uh, Dr. Silas Mitchell, and he treated a lot of wealthy white women who were going through postpartum depression. But since they didn't really have any understanding of hormones at the time, much less of mental health, um, basically they just told the women that they needed to lie down. This was literally what he told her to do. Live as domestic a life as possible. Have your child with you all the time. Lie down an hour after each meal and have but two hours intellectual life a day, and never touch pen, brush, or pencil as long as you live. What could go wrong, right? What could go wrong if you tell intelligent, sensitive, accomplished women just to lie down and not do anything and not think about anything and not live their lives? So you may have read or seen before her other extremely famous piece, The Yellow Wallpaper. So it's this essay about a woman who is lying in bed staring at a yellow wallpaper um, while she tries to recover from an unmentioned illness, but it's generally thought that it was her dealing with her own postpartum depression. So the yellow wallpaper is like a really famous feminist piece uh, because it's about how it felt for women just to be confined and not taken seriously and how it felt to be told that your raging hormones and mental health was down to your uterus wandering loose in your body. So really, it was kind of a piece about women and medicine, but it was very much inspired uh, by Gilman's own experience. As I mentioned previously, Gilman was a very popular lecturer and activist. She made a lot of her living traveling around, giving lectures. She was really into suffragism. Uh, basically, she believed that women should have the right to vote, as well as to work outside of the home and earn money. But she was not a feminist. Um, she was actually very clear about that. She said that she abominates being called a feminist. She believed in suffragism, but she didn't believe in the rest of the feminist movement. She was made uncomfortable by a lot of it. She also, it's important to acknowledge, was engaged in some more sort of questionable activism and some outright racism. So one of the things that she believed in was the Bellamy movement, the nationalists. And they had this idea of like a utopian industrial society 
where almost everything was done on large machines, which gave humans a lot of leisure time, which is kind of interesting. But she also was a nativist. Um, and the nativists believed not that the native people to North America were the best, but that the recent immigrants, the white people, were the best. So basically the nativists believed that they were Anglo-Saxon above everything, which she outright said, um, and that other non-white populations should be controlled. So she wasn't an outright eugenicist because that hadn't quite been invented yet, but she was one of the people at the forefront of that movement. So like many of our other core authors, she was not a perfect person. And I'm never advocating that we believe wholeheartedly in everything anybody writes. But I do think it's important to acknowledge that she, like all of our other authors, had good parts and bad parts, and some of what she wrote down is useful to our larger discussion. Speaking of which, she was an extremely prolific author. Um, over the course of her life, she published eight, 186 short stories, uh, three poetry collections, nine novels, nine nonfiction books, and dozens and dozens of nonfiction articles, many of which were scientific in nature. She also had her own magazine for a long time, The Forerunner, which she wrote and published all of, every edition, uh, from 1909 to 1916. So we are focusing on her other extremely famous piece, Women and Economics, which has the excellent subtitle, A Study of the Economic Relation Between Men and Women as a Factor in Social Evolution. So it's very much about the social world, the social way that we had dictated that men and women live, and the social way that we had dictated who could participate in the economy. Because during her time period, especially among wealthy white women, women just didn't work. They didn't work outside the home, they didn't earn money. And Gilman's point was that maybe that was a bad way to structure the economy. So basically the book is about marriage and motherhood and labor, and it's considered kind of a masterpiece. It's considered one of the classics of feminist literature. So we are only going to read the first chapter, and it's a pretty repetitive idea, but it's worth reading. And so we begin with chapter one. So Gilman was very interested in science, and specifically in Darwinism. And so basically she starts by comparing the human journey to that of many animals. Since we have learned to study the development of human life, as we study the evolution of species throughout the animal kingdom, some peculiar phenomena, which have puzzled the philosopher and moralist for so long, begin to show themselves in a new light. We begin to see that so far from being inscrutable problems, these sorrows and perplexities of our lives are but the natural results of natural causes. And that as soon as we ascertain these causes, we can do much to remove them. So basically, she's saying that the same way that we study evolution in other species, we could study evolution in humans that we could look at where we started as a way of figuring out where we ended up. Part of that, she says, is being affected by our environment. In spite of the power of the individual will to struggle against conditions, to resist them for a while, and sometimes to overcome them, it remains true that the human creature is affected by his environment as is every other living thing. So very similar to the way these little finches develop different beaks as they develop different things that they need to eat, She's saying that humans develop a different way of living as a way of adapting to their social circumstances. So that perhaps what we're doing is not what we have always done. She goes on. But beyond these forces, we come under the effect of a third set of conditions peculiar to our human status, namely social conditions. In the organic interchanges which constitute social life, we are affected by each other to a degree beyond what is found even among the most gregarious of animals. So she's continuing this metaphor of like studying the evolution of humans, but she's saying it's not just uh, the physical world, like it's not just us adjusting our beaks to different berries. She's saying it's also the social world. So outside of natural causes, outside of like food and shelter, she's saying the social world is what really guided our development. The food supply of the animal is the largest passive factor in his development. The process by which he obtains his food supply, the largest active factor in his development. So like for a normal animal, what is the food? How do you get it? The human animal is no exception to this rule. Climate affects him, weather affects him, enemies affect him, but most of all, he is affected like every other living creature by what he does for his living. So again, she's saying like, yes, we're subject to the same stuff as all the other animals, but 
the way that we get our food is a little different. It's not just about like hunting and gathering. There's a whole different element at play in regard to how people get food. Specifically, economic relationships. In view of these facts, attention is now called to a certain marked and peculiar economic condition affecting the human race and unparalleled in the organic world. We are the only animal species in which the female depends on the male for food. The only animal species in which the sex relation is also an economic relation. So this is the main point of what she's trying to say in the whole book and also in chapter one. Basically that because of our social conditions, we have made a world for ourselves in which women depend on men for food. So basically she's gonna expand on this metaphor with a couple of other animals in order to point out that that's kind of weird and other animals don't do this. She talks about how it is commonly assumed that this condition is also obtained among other animals, but such is not the case. So she gives a few examples of like, yeah, sometimes when they're nursing or when they're laying eggs or something, the male of a species will bring food to the female of a species, but not all the time, not for the course of their whole life, like only when they're actively nursing or nesting or something. In no case is the female throughout her life supported by the male. So this is kind of an interesting point. She's saying we are in a situation where the women get food from the men, but other animals just don't do this. And maybe we should think about why not. So next she starts to address how common this idea is that women are dependent on men for food. In the human species, the condition is permanent and general, though there are exceptions. And though the present century is witnessing the beginnings of a great change in this respect. We have not been accustomed to the fact beyond our loose generalization that it was natural and that other animals did so too. So basically she's saying, we don't question this. We are told that it's normal. We are told that it's natural. We're told that everybody does it. In fact, we're told that other animals do it. To many, this view will not seem clear at first. In the case of working peasant women or females of savage tribes and the general household industry of women will be instanced against it. So she's acknowledging that yes, there are some examples where this does not happen. For instance, with very poor women, they work outside the home or with savage women, they work outside the home. So basically she's saying, yeah, this isn't the case for everybody. And that's a good acknowledgement because of course it wasn't the case for everybody. But as we know, there is a tendency among wealthy white intellectuals to assume that everybody is living the way they're living. And that's kind of what she's doing here. She's kind of saying like, this is happening to everybody even though it probably wasn't even happening to everybody in her city, but whatever. So then she goes forward with this metaphor about how horses, even though they are capable of feeding themselves, don't because they are enslaved. So she's comparing the horse to women. The horse in his free natural condition is economically independent. He gets his living by his own exertions, irrespective of any other creature. So basically a horse who is free just eats. He doesn't need humans to eat. He can just walk around and eat. The horse in his present condition of slavery is economically dependent. He gets his living at the hands of his master and his exertions, though strenuous, bear no direct relation to his living. So basically she's saying that a wild horse could just eat whatever he wants, but an enslaved horse, she was a, not a fan of pet animals, an enslaved horse um, does not have the option to just eat whenever he wants. He gets food whenever his master gives him food. So even though he might be working really hard, he might be jumping the highest jumps or the most beautiful dressage test that has no direct relationship to his food. And she's saying it's kind of the same for women. Even though they work hard as mothers, as housewives, that doesn't directly bring them food. They're still dependent upon someone else. They're still dependent upon a master. So she says, in studying the economic position of the sexes collectively, the difference is most marked. As a social animal, the economic status of man rests on the combined and exchange services of vast numbers of progressively specialized individuals. And you know this part, right? This is what we've been talking about all semester. The idea that people don't make everything themselves anymore, not in the industrial age. Instead, they depend on a whole network of people, the butcher, the baker, the car maker, basically an, a progressively specialized individuals make progressively specialized products and then they 
trade and sell amongst themselves. So she's saying for men, they are living in this kind of economic world. But for women, they are limited. Such economic processes as women have been allowed to exercise are of the earliest and most primitive kind, essentially like bartering. Were men to perform no economic services, save as are still performed by women, our racial status and economics would be reduced to the most painful limitations. So basically, she's saying that if men were asked to behave the way that women behave, in the sense that they were really only allowed to barter because they weren't allowed to work and they weren't allowed to earn money, that our race would drop uh, in terms of our sort of our status, like our intellectual quality. So basically, it's again, low-key racist, maybe high-key racist, but she's saying that if, if we don't allow women to participate in economics on the same level as men, our society drops down to like a prehistorical level. An interesting claim. So again, she's sort of going forward with this idea that women are kept almost enslaved and not allowed to participate in economics at the same level as men. Next, she addresses how difficult this would be to overcome because we're so set in our way of doing things. To take from any community its male workers would paralyze it economically to a far greater degree than to remove its female workers. The labor now performed by the women could be performed by the men, requiring only the setting back of many advanced workers. But the labor now performed by the men could not be performed by the women without generations of effort and adaptation. So she's saying basically, if we tried to switch uh, men's labor and women's labor, the men could do women's labor because it doesn't require that much training. Uh, it's not that specialized. Like, can men sweep? Yes, they can. But if women were to try to do men's labor, it would require generations of effort and adaptation because women just weren't educated in the same ways. Uh, they didn't have the knowledge required to do this kind of work. They didn't have the training required to do this kind of work. And so it would take several generations to catch women up to the level of the way that the men were competing in the economic world as a whole. So basically she's saying, if we switched, the men could do our work, well, we can't do their work because you didn't teach us how. She goes on to say, the male human being is thousands of years in advance of the female and economic status. Speaking collectively, men produce and distribute wealth, and women receive it at their hands. So basically, because we have set up the entire society this way, because we have spent multiple generations training men to compete and training women to stay home, we've created an environment in which men do economy, and women just sort of like receive whatever's left over. The final part of this is that it's maybe not going that well. The comfort, the luxury, the necessities of life itself, which the woman receives, are obtained by the husband and given to her by him. And when the woman, left alone with no man to support her, tries to meet her own economic necessities, the difficulties which confront her, prove conclusively what the general economic status of the woman is. So basically, because we set up the system this way, because the men are in control and the women can't do anything, if a woman does try to do something, if a woman does try to earn her own living, she's really not able to. She's not able to enter the workforce. She's not able to support herself without some man. So Gilman is saying, maybe this is not a great solution, considering that women make up half the population. Maybe the general economic status of women should be elevated to like improve society as a whole. So next, Gilman begins to question how women participate in the economy. If they're not allowed to work outside of the home, do they participate in some other way? And her first thought is maybe they participate via marriage. Maybe they're part of like a partnership and without them, the husband wouldn't be able to succeed. So maybe marriage as a partnership is their contribution. Women consume economic goods. What economic product do they give in exchange for what they consume? The claim that marriage is a partnership in which the two persons married produce wealth, which neither of them separately could produce, will not bear examination. So she's like, maybe marriage is a partnership and that's how women help, but if they're not really allowed to help with business, if they're not allowed to like go to work with their husband or assist him from his work from home, maybe they're not really helping. So she goes on to say, 
If the wife is not then truly a business partner, in what ways does she earn from her husband the food, clothing, and shelter she receives at his hand? By house service, it will instantly be replied. Their labor in the household has genuine economic value. So she's like, okay, well maybe if they're not partners, maybe at least they're doing housework. Maybe the work that they do in terms of like cooking and cleaning is economically valuable. Maybe that's how they help. The labor of women in the house certainly enables men to produce more wealth than they otherwise could. In this way, women are economic factors in society. And this is true, right? If someone else is taking care of all of your food and they're cleaning for you and they do all of your laundry and they like make your life a little bit more pleasant, you could get more stuff done. So she's saying, well, maybe if women are taking care of all of that stuff, that's how they're contributing. But she doesn't really buy it. The labor which the wife performs in the household is given as part of her functional duty, not as employment. It is held to be their duty as women to do this work and their economic status bears no relation to their economic de domestic labors unless it is an inverse one. So really she's like, yeah, this work is work, but since we're not getting paid for it, maybe it's not really work. Since it's considered our duty to do all of these things around the house, maybe we're not really contributing because we're just doing what we're supposed to do, not paid labor. So she says, maybe it's not really a job. Maybe we're not really contributing because frankly, the harder we work, the less money we get. To take this ground and hold it honestly, wives as earners through domestic service are entitled to the wages of cooks, housemaids, nursemaids, seamstresses, or housekeepers, and no more. But the salient fact in this discussion is that whatever the economic value the domestic energy industry of women is, they do not get it. So basically, she's like, you could argue that women should get paid for being nursemaids and seamstresses and housekeepers, but the truth is they don't. We don't consider that work valuable. So even if we did want to talk about the idea of paying women for all of the work that they did at home, she's saying it still is not a very good argument because the fact remains that we don't pay women for the work that they do at home. So even though, yes, housework is very involved and it can be a full-time job, especially if there are children in there, it's still not work because you don't get paid. So she's saying that do women participate in the economy by doing housework? No. She does not like that argument and she's throwing it out. So having dismissed the idea that women earn their keep via house cleaning, she's going to examine the idea that maybe women earn their keep via mothering. The ground that women earn their living by domestic labor is instantly forsaken, and we are told that they obtain their livelihood as mothers. If this is so, if motherhood is an exchangeable commodity given by women in payment for clothes and food, then we must, of course, find some relation between the quantity or quality of motherhood and the quantity or quality of the pay. So she's saying, all right, well, if we earn our keep by being mothers, then there must be some relationship you must earn more money if you have more children, or earn more money if you're a better mother, which is kind of an interesting argument. But she says, no, nah, she hasn't really seen this play out. This being true, then the women who are not mothers would have no economic status at all. Also interesting, if you have no children, you get no payment. But this is obviously absurd. The childless wife has as much money as the mother of many, more. For the, la the children of the latter consume what would otherwise be hers. So basically she's like, okay, well that's absurd because women who don't have any children don't have less money, they have more money because their children aren't sucking all of it up. Visibly and upon the face of it, women are not maintained in economic prosperity proportioned to their motherhood. So basically it was an interesting argument that you would be paid according to how many children you had or how good you were at it but it doesn't really work. It doesn't have any face value. And also she argues, she hates it. Are we willing to hold this ground even in theory? Are we willing to consider motherhood as a business, a form of commercial exchange? Are the cares and duties of the mother, her travail and her love, commodities to be exchanged for bread? It is revolting to consider. 
Nothing could be more repugnant to human feeling, more socially and individually injurious, than to make motherhood a trade. So basically, she's like, not only does that not work out mathematically, it doesn't work out emotionally. To suggest that women are paid per child is gross. To suggest that women are paid to love their kids is repugnant. So basically, she's going hard against this argument. We do not pay women for motherhood, she says. So then she starts to address why we think that motherhood makes women unfit for the workforce. It being shown that the economic status of women bears no relation to her motherhood, either in quantity or quality, it is then alleged that motherhood renders a woman unfit for economic production, and that therefore it is right that she be supported by her husband. Also an interesting argument. So it doesn't matter how many children you have or how good at it, somehow motherhood renders you incapable of participating in the workforce. And this argument, you could say, kind of has lasted. Uh, we have continual discussions about maternity leave, about mothers returning to the workforce, about trying to be a working mother. Like, this is something that women all over the world are still contending with. But as a society, we have agreed that mothers can also have jobs. But again, not during her time period. As the maternal duties of other females do not unfit them from getting their own living, and also the livings of their young, it would seem that the human maternal duties require the segregation of the entire energies of the mother to the service of the child during her entire adult life, or so large a proportion of them that not enough remains to devote to the individual interests of the mother. Such a condition, if it did exist, would, of course, excuse and justify the pitiful dependence of the human female and her support by the male. So basically, she's saying that people are acting like being a mother requires all of your energy for all of your adult life. And that basically, once you have had a child, you are just unfit for the workforce because you're going to be focusing so hard on your motherhood that you won't have energy left for anything else. Not only not work, but also not your own individual interests. She's saying that we view motherhood as like all consuming, even though other animals don't live this way. Is this the condition of motherhood? Does the human mother, by her motherhood, thereby lose control of her brain and body? Lose the power and skill and desire for any other work? Basically, she's like, do you really think this is true? Do you really think that all women lose all control of their minds and bodies the instant they have a child? That they're no longer capable of thinking and working? That they're just gonna sit around and be mothers all the time forever? And she's like, mm, no, this isn't the way that this works. We see, the human mother worked far harder than a mayor, laboring her lifelong in the service, not of her children only, but of men. Husbands, brothers, fathers, whatever male relative she has. For mother and sister also, for the church a little if she's allowed, for society if she is able, for charity and education and reform. Working in many ways that are not the ways of motherhood. So basically she's saying, if you look around, you will notice that the women in your life do a lot of work. And not all of it is about being mothers. A lot of it is caretaking. They're basically responsible for all of the other men in their life. But if you really look, you'll probably notice that the women in your life do other stuff too. They do stuff for the church. They do stuff for the rest of society. She's saying clearly motherhood does not require all of the energies for every woman their entire life because clearly women are also out there doing other stuff. If you just look around, you will see them. So she goes on to say, you may have noticed that women are working very hard. It is not motherhood that keeps the housewife on her feet from dawn till dusk. It is house service, not child service. Women work longer and harder than most men and not solely in maternal duties. In spite of her supposed segregation to maternal duties, the human female the world over works at extra maternal duties for hours enough to provide her with an independent living and then is denied independence on the ground that motherhood prevents her from working. So basically, Gilman is super frustrated. She's like, people keep acting like motherhood is all consuming, but have you not noticed that we're also doing all this other stuff and motherhood? Like, have you not noticed that in addition to motherhood, we are also 
running the lives for the rest of the adults. We are also running the church. We are also running the charity organizations. She's like, we're doing all this stuff. We're just not getting paid. And you're acting like we're not capable of doing all this stuff, other stuff, even though clearly we're doing it all around you all of the time. So she goes on. If this ground were tenable, we should find a world full of women who never lifted a finger save in the service of children and of the men who did all the work besides and waited on the women whom motherhood prevented from waiting on themselves. So basically, she's like, yeah, if this were true, if the only thing that women did was take care of children, nothing else would get done and you would notice that because the men would have to tend to them. The men would have to take care of literally everything else. And the fact that the men don't take care of everything else indicates that motherhood is not all consuming the way that people were trying to sell it during the Victorian era. So to wrap up this argument, Gilman basically kind of doubles down on the stuff that she's been saying about the relative lack of value of housework and childcare, and talks about how limiting women to just those two things is silly. A human female, healthy, sound, has 25 years of life before she is a mother and should have 25 years more after the period of such maternal service as is expected of her has been given. So basically she's saying our reproductive years don't last our entire life, which is true. So are we just valueless in that time before we have children? Are we valueless in that time after we have children? Wouldn't it be silly just to like act like half of the species has no value for two thirds of their life? She then goes on to say, in fact, we know that women are very hard workers. We know that they are constantly working inside the home. The working power of the mother has always been a prominent factor in human life. She is the worker par excellence, but her work is not such as to affect her economic status. Her living, all that she gets, these bear no relation to her power to produce wealth, to her services in the house, to her motherhood. So even though women work very hard all of the time and everybody knows it, that has nothing to do with money for them. Basically money and work are just totally separate for women in this particular level of society. These things bear relation only to the man she marries, the man she depends on, on how much he has and how much he is willing to give her. So basically, no matter how hard you work at childbirth, at child rearing, at keeping your house clean, none of that is going to earn you money. The only way you can get money is through your husband. The female of genus Homo is economically dependent on the male. He is her food supply. So this doesn't mean she's going to eat him, but it does mean that if she wants food, it has to come through this guy. She can't work outside the home, so she can't get food on her own. All of the work she does inside the home does not directly translate into food. So basically, her food supply is tied to marriage. So even though this is a relatively simple argument, this is an important argument. Basically, Gilman is saying we can't allow the survival of women to be tied to men. Because basically, if you couldn't work outside the home and you couldn't earn your own money, you were literally dependent on the men in your life for food and for shelter and for medicine. So basically, one half of society being fully dependent on the other half of society wasn't working very well. And it also wasn't a good way to move society forward. So her argument is that we have to either pay women for the work that they do or allow them to work outside the home so that they can be more independent and they can sort of develop as humans. So again, this probably sounds kind of unfamiliar to you because a lot of women do work now. But she had to write these things down so that it would occur to people that women could work outside the home. So, as always, I am looking forward to talking with you about it. Uh, send me an email if you have any questions, and I'll see you soon.